please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Charles McCrory. Well, thank you for is this working? Yeah. Thank you for that really uh, kind introduction, and thank you for being here today. I'm really excited to share a little bit of, of how we think about chemistry and how we think about a specifically carbon dioxide reduction. Now, before I begin, you know, this is a big field where thousands of researchers across the world are working on this right now. How to convert carbon dioxide using green electricity into useful chemicals and fuels. Uh, and so it would be disingenuous of me to only talk about my work. So you'll see me talking about a lot of people's work in this area, trying to frame it for all of you of what are the big ideas and how we think about catalysis and what even catalysis means. Um, my work, you'll see when we have the citations on the bottom, will be in purple. Everyone else's will be in a black. You'll see a lot of black because, like I said, there are a lot of people working in this area. So this is the vision. We want, to, we want to take green electricity from renewable energy sources, carbon dioxide, and convert it to different things like fuels and chemical feedstocks. Fuels that can be used for storage and transportation, or feedstocks, chemical feedstocks that can be used for the conversion into fine chemicals and products. So what I'm gonna do to talk about today is, first I wanna show you, talk a little bit about the intermittency of green electricity and why we even need energy storage and why I think solar fuels, carbon dioxide reduction, is a really good way of storing energy in the form of chemical bonds. We'll talk about designing catalysts for solar fuels and what catalysis even means in the context of chemistry and electrochemistry. We'll talk about controlling this thing I have in, in quotation marks called microenvironments to uh, improve catalysts. And we'll talk about sort of the future direction of this, field, of this field, which is talking about CO2 capture and conversion. Not just taking carbon dioxide, converting it to fuels, but actually capturing it from the atmosphere and using that captured carbon dioxide for fuel generation. So if we think about energy use in greenhouse gases, you know, we, lots of people have shown this curve. I'm sh sure you might, might have seen this curve before. Carbon dioxide emissions have grown steadily over the past uh, 50 years, 60 years. And that growth in carbon dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been closely tied to carbon dioxide emissions. So the more that we emit, not surprisingly, the more carbon dioxide we have in the atmosphere. Now, one way to help curb this is to stop or, or to reduce the amount of fossil fuels that we burn and bring on other sources of energy like renewables. And actually, that's what the world is already doing. If we look at sort of where we're at in the projections from the US uh, uh, Energy Information Administration of where energy consumption by energy source will be over the next 30 years, they're expecting a large growth in the renewables. There's still a lot of fossil fuels being burned, natural gas, coal, but this renewables is really growing. And that's where most of the growth in electricity is coming from worldwide. It's coming from this idea of bringing on renewable energy sources, specifically solar energy and wind energy. And in the United States already, about 13.4% of our energy in the United States, our electricity in the United States, comes from solar and wind. And of course, in California, it's closer to 25%. So that's a large amount. And if we, oops, and if we think about projections over the next several years, the next 30 years, it's expected that we're gonna get up to closer to 36% in th uh, of solar and wind energy for electricity consumption. 36% of, of our electricity will come from solar and wind energy by 2050, which is a large amount. But there's a problem with green electricity. There's a problem with solar energy and wind energy. And that problem comes from something called inter intermittency. So if we look over the course of two days this year, of wind, hourly wind and solar energy production, we see, not surprisingly, that solar energy production increases when it's light outside from 6 a.m. till about 7 p.m. and then decreases. 
And wind energy is sort of all over the place. So every day, you have intermittent sources. It's not a constant source of energy. It cycles. In solar energy, it's sort of a cycle that you can predict. In wind energy, it's not. When it gets cloudy or storming outside, you get less solar energy, more wind, but it's very intermittent. It's not a constant source of energy. It's not reliable in that sense. And even from month to month, again, not surprisingly, wind energy is sort of all over the place. And solar energy during the summer months is larger and during the winter months is less because you have more daylight during the summer months and less daylight during the winter months. So you have this in, inconsistent energy source. And we have to think of ways to, to think about this. How do we store the energy when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing to use it during the time when it's dark outside and we have calm skies? So again, we need the ability to store energy during peak production so that we can use it during periods of low green electricity production. Now, there are lots of, of, of ways that people have thought about that they can do this. Uh, one of the most common ways today is pumped hydro storage. And actually in California, this is one of the primary ways that electric, uh, green electricity is stored or electricity in general is stored. During off-peak times when electricity generation is cheap or when you have a lot of electricity on the grid, you can pump water basically up a mountain into a storage reservoir. In time, so you're using electricity to pump water up the mountain. When electricity generation is less, that water trickles back down, turns turbines, and generates electricity. So pumped hydro storage is about 80, uh, about somewhere between, uh, yeah, 93% of all utility scale energy storage in the United States comes from pumped hydro storage. And it's really efficient, it's about 80% energy efficiency. So only 20% of that electricity that you use to pump the water up the hill, up the mountain, you only lose about 20% of that electricity. 80% you get back when it comes back down. The problem, you need a mountain and you need lots of water. <laughs> a lot of places have mountains, a lot of places have lots of water, not many places have both at the same time. Michigan has tons of water, where I'm from, there's no mountains in Michigan, or so we can't use pumped hydro storage there. But where you can use it, it's really efficient. You can think about batteries, lithium ion batteries, uh, or intercalation battery, batteries. The most common one is lithium ion batteries, the things you find in your cell phones, your laptops, some of you, your cars. Um, and these work by intercalating ions in different, fa in different states, um, you can charge it and discharge it by taking ions in and out of a graphite anode. Um, this is ubiquitous in electronics. It's ubiquitous in the uh, automotive industry. Um, and it can be very efficient. It can be up to 90% energy efficient. Um, more often, it's a little less than that. But that's the maximum efficiency. And there's lots of current research into power density, scalability, cycling lifetimes. And this is a really useful way of storing energy. And you can also store it in a different type of battery called a flow battery, which is also charging and discharging in a slightly different way um, by, by relying on the transport of soluble uh, charged species. Uh, and this can also be very efficient. And this is a little easier to scale either, even than lithium ion batteries. So there are lots of different ways that are out there to store energy. Lots of different techniques we can use to store energy. But I want to talk about a different approach, one that's not yet commercializable, one that's sort of not new, but something that uh, there's a lot of people really interested in. And again, it goes back to this picture of using these renewable electricity, and instead of storing it in a battery or pumping water up the hill, using it to convert a waste, carbon dioxide, and water into useful things we care about like fuel you can put into a combustion engine, or chemicals uh, and chemical feedstocks that we can use to make consumer chemicals and plastics. So the way we think about, you know, this picture right here of this electrochemical CO2 conversion, 
This is the, the, the device you use to do this is called an electrolyzer. You're taking electricity and you're using that electricity to convert uh, uh, chemicals. And so this is an example of a picture of an electrolyzer. In an electrolyzer, you have two electrodes, one called an anode and one called a cathode. They're usually separated by a separator. We're not gonna talk too much about that. But you have an anode and a cathode and they do different chemical reactions at both. So the first example I'm gonna show you of an electrolyzer is for something that is called water splitting or hydrogen evolution. If you've ever heard of the hydrogen economy, it's based on this reaction here. The idea that you can take water and split it into its constituent elements, oxygen and hydrogen. And you can do this at this sort of device. And so we're gonna break this overall reaction into its two half reactions. On one side, we're gonna take water and it's gonna be oxidized. It's going to lose electrons to form oxygen and protons or protonated water, acidic water. Those electrons then pass through a circuit and are used at the other electrode. The protons transport to the other electrode as well and they recombine, those four protons recombine with those four electrons to generate hydrogen. So you've taken water and you split up it apart into oxygen and hydrogen using this device. So if we write our two half reactions, water goes to oxygen plus protons plus electrons, and protons plus electrons go to hydrogen, and we sum them together, we add them just like they're two equations, the sum is the overall reaction that we're going for. So that's how an electrolyzer works. It takes this overall reaction, breaks it into half reactions, and drives each of those half reactions at an electrode. And so when you, when you set up an electrolyzer like this, you can actually see, this will take a second, um, but you can actually see bubbles forming oxygen bubbles and hydrogen bubbles forming on these two electrodes, this anode and this cathode. So you can actually see, so this is, the, this is this type of electrolyzer hooked up. Current, they're using a battery to pass current through it. And you can see hydrogen bubbles forming on this platinum cathode and oxygen bubbles forming on this iridium oxide anode. So actually, actually, before I was a professor at Michigan, I was a senior scientist at a Department of Energy Research Center called the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis. And I looked at different anode and cathode materials for this reaction. My job was to sort of evaluate different anodes and cathodes. And it's a really cool reaction. Department of Energy is super interested in it. One of the new earth shots, what's called an earth shot by the Department of Energy, the long-term goals of the department is to make this reaction more cost effective. Because hydrogen, it turns out, isn't a bad fuel. And it can, it's been demonstrated that this reaction can run with anywhere between 60 to 80% efficiency in electrolyzers. The problem is that hydrogen isn't very energy dense and it can be hard to transport. And there's a lot of research going in. It, it's, it's the least dense gas you know, that we have. And there's a lot of research in how to liquefy it, how to pressurize it, how to transport it, but there's a large energy and cost associated with that. So wouldn't it be cool if we could do a different reaction and use these same protons and electrons that we generated at this anode for a different chemical reaction? Something where we could make a product make a fuel that's a little easier to transport and use broadly. And so we can think about the carbon dioxide reaction. We're still gonna do the same thing at the anode. We're gonna take water and break it apart into oxygen. We're gonna generate protons that can transport to the cathode. We're gonna generate electrons 
that can transport through a wire to the cathode, but we're gonna combine them with carbon dioxide. And in this case, I'm just showing the reaction of carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide, but it's a different chemical. So we can do the same thing, the same electrolyzer, but for CO2 reduction instead of hydrogen evolution. So we have a different half reaction and we sum it all together, we get two carbon dioxides going to two carbon monoxides and an oxygen. So we can convert this carbon dioxide in water into fuel or chemicals and oxygen. And I'm showing carbon monoxide here, but you could think of lots of different fuels depending on the amount of electrons and amount of protons that you transfer. You could make methanol, you could make ethanol, ethylene, a lot of different fuels and chemicals that are really valuable and that we can transport using existing infrastructure, the same infrastructure that we use now to transport things like gasoline. But it's really hard scientifically. And lots of people, like I said, thousands of researchers are hard at work to make this efficient and scalable. Um, and yeah, again, I'm showing carbon monoxide here, but you could think about lots of different products that you could make using this general idea of using an electrolyzer and using the protons and electrons at the anode in order to uh, drive the reaction at the cathode. But in order to do this, in order to do this efficiently, we need catalysts. We need specific materials that are good at driving exactly the reactions that we want. So just before I talk about catalysts, I do wanna point out that I, I showed this picture of an electrolyzer. This is sort of the simplest picture of the electrolyzer. It's been around for, I think, 100 years or so, maybe a little less, maybe 70 years. Electrolyzers have come a long way, especially for CO2. They look a lot more complicated now, but they still have your anode and your cathode, your two electrodes, in some way for electrons and protons to transport between them. So this is a new a schematic of a more complicated called gas diffusion, uh, or membrane uh, electrode assembly using gas diffusion electrodes. Uh, this is an example that was put together of one that we actually use in some of my research that was put together by Dr. Libo Yao, a researcher in my lab, and a collaborator, Professor Narala Singh. But you can make these more complicated systems that do the exact same thing as just sticking those two electrodes in water with the different chemicals. But when you look at this more complicated electrode and you look at one of these cathodes or anodes, it's a complicated system that involves catalysts. Catalyst supports the electrodes, polymers, lots of stuff goes into this. And every single aspect of this at every scale from 100 micrometers to nanometers is really an uh, intense area of research that's funded in the United States and around the world. I'm gonna focus only on sort of the, the nanometer scale. I'm gonna talk about today the catalysts. So not all of the other stuff that goes into these electrodes, but just what happens at the catalyst. Okay, so what is a catalyst? You know, I keep talking about catalysts, I keep talking about these materials, what is a catalyst? So, catalyst 101. So if we have a reaction, and I'm just gonna draw the half reaction here, carbon dioxide plus two protons plus two electron goes to H2O and carbon monoxide. We've got a couple of things. If you look at this reaction, we can draw this reaction. You're going from this reactant to this product. Here I'm gonna show two axes on a graph. The x-axis is called the reaction coordinate. It's how the reaction proceeds. It's just a measure of how far the reaction has proceeded going from carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide. That's our reactant, what we start with, that's our product. The y-axis is the energy needed to drive the reaction, or is energy. Now, it'd be great if we go straight across, but we can't. We have to climb this mountain in order to do this reaction. So just the difference between 
the reactants and the products, the energy difference between them, we call that the free energy of reaction. That's the minimum energy needed to convert reactants into products if we didn't have to worry about activating the reactants in some way. Delta G double dagger right here is called the activation energy. It's the extra energy you have to put in the system in order to actually drive the reaction. So delta G reaction is the energy it would take if you had a mountain in front of you, if you could just walk straight through the mountain. That's delta G reaction. You just walk straight through and don't have to worry about it. But in reality, that's not practical. You can't walk through a mountain. You actually have to climb over it. And it takes a lot more energy and time to climb the mountain than it would if you could just tunnel straight through it. So in chemistry, we always have to go over this activation energy. So what is a catalyst? Well, a catalyst is something that accelerates the reactions by helping break bonds in the reactants to form products. And it does this by stabilizing intermediates by absorbing them to catalyst sites. So what do I mean by this? Well, if we go back, or if we look at this reaction right here, the carbon dioxide reduction reaction, we're taking carbon dioxide, we're going to carbon monoxide, we're gonna absorb that carbon, carbon dioxide to a catalyst, And then it's going to actually go through a lot of different configurations before we get to carbon monoxide as we add protons and electrons to the system. And then finally, that final product desorbs and goes away. So we start with carbon monoxide, we go through a COOH intermediate, we get carbon monoxide, and then that desorbs. The point is that we're absorbing this to the catalyst surface and it's stabilizing each of these states. And that's the important point of what the catalyst does. And by doing so, it facilitates the reaction. So if we go back to our mountain picture, if we have to go through an intermediate state in order to get to carbon monoxide, what the catalyst is doing is it's stabilizing this intermediate by binding it to the catalyst, to a metal. That lowers the energy of that intermediate and therefore lowers the activation energy. It's like we're blowing the top out of the mountain and making it smaller so it's easier to climb over. All by binding it to this metal site. So we're decreasing the activation energy. So it's all about finding catalysts that stabilize the important intermediates for the reaction. So again, so if we look here at this plot where we're looking at rate and binding energy, we have the carbon monoxide, it binds to the catalyst, it forms some intermediates and releases carbon monoxide. We're looking at, the, in this case, the binding energy of this intermediate right here on the x-axis going from strong binding to weak binding. And on the y-axis, we're looking at the rate of the reaction under a specific set of conditions. And what we see if we start at weak binding and start increasing the energy, you know, when you weakly bind, you get some reaction energy, but you know, if it's too weak, you're not stabilizing it enough. And then finally, as you keep going to stronger and stronger binding, you end up with a catalyst, a metal site that binds it just strong enough so you get a really high rate. That's the system that really stabilized that intermediate enough so you can drive the reaction forward. Now, there are a lot of other metals on this site that have stronger binding but are lower, are, are lower rates. So what's happening there? What happens when you get to something like platinum? Well, platinum, you've stabilized it too much and it doesn't want to leave. So you've really decreased that activation energy so much that you get into this region where, where you do, you've uh, stabilized that intermediate so much that you get into this region 
where now doing the second step in converting that intermediate to the product is super hard. So you want to stabilize the intermediate, but you don't want to stabilize it too much. It's like a Goldilocks effect. It has to be just right in order to get the catalysis you want. And that's the hard part. It's easy to find things that can stabilize intermediates. It's hard to find things that stabilize the intermediate you want at just the right binding energy, just the right amount in order to get the products you want. Now, gold looks pretty good from this graph. This is sometimes called a volcano plot because it looks sort of like a volcano, I guess, a weird one. But anyway, you have this gold right there and it looks pretty good. And silver doesn't look bad either, even though it's a little bit on the weak binding side, it still has a pretty good rate. And those are great for making carbon monoxide as the product. They're really great at converting carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide actually, even though it's a poison and we all have carbon monoxide, or not all, but many people have carbon monoxide sensors in their home to look for that because you know it'll, it'll kill you if you breathe it. Um, it is a useful feedstock for chemical transformations. But it's not necessarily where the, the best feedstock that we really want to make. So this is a graph of all of the different products you could think of, not all, but many of the different products you can think of for CO2 reduction, where you can take carbon dioxide to different useful chemicals and fuels. On the x-axis here is the energy content. It's how much energy is stored from that solar electricity in each of these different products. The y-axis is the market price, how valuable those different products are. And the size of the circle is how big the market is for those different products. And if you look at this graph, and these lines, uh, the dashed lines are just um, the price point for where you need to be above to make any of these products commercially using current solar fuels or current solar electricity in case of $50 per megawatt hour or the best case scenario for solar electricity at 20 megawatts per hour. The point is, if we look at carbon monoxide, it's got an okay market price. It's a little small. There's not much of a market for it. And it's got okay energy content. But where we really want to go are things like ethanol and ethylene and methanol that have good market prices, large markets, and, lo and store lots of solar electricity. And the reason you want lots of energy content is you're storing that electricity so you can use it again. So you want to store it in the fewest molecules that you can, the most energy density that you can. So we really want to make products like this Carbon monoxide's okay, but we really want to move this direction. So we showed this very simple diagram for how we can convert CO2 to carbon monoxide. And it's about the stability of the intermediates that drives this. And gold and silver do okay for carbon monoxide, but it turns out that when you go to want to make something like methanol or ethylene, there are different intermediates you have, to, you have to stabilize. And there is one catalyst that does this, it's copper. Copper is probably one of the most highly studied catalysts for CO2 reduction because it can make a lot of different products. And instead of this simple case, where you have a pretty straightforward series of intermediates, now you get something crazy like this. And this is a truncation of something that would take up about two screens if I showed you all of the different routes that can occur on copper. And this is why it's scientifically challenging. All of these different intermediates are stabilized under different conditions at different rates and different energies. And all of these um, can lead to different products along different pathways. It's super complicated uh, to study this. It stabilizes a lot of intermediates, and we actually can see, or it's been seen before, a uh, Jeremy and coworker saw 16 different products coming off of copper with different amount, when you put different amounts of energy into the system. 16 different products simultaneously from the same catalyst because of all of these different pathways.
And the thing is, we want to stabilize one. We want to make just methanol, or we want to make just ethylene. So how do we stabilize specific pathways? How do we stabilize specific intermediates or lead out of all of these different pathways, travel along just one to the product that we want? And that's the challenge, the big challenge in CO2 reduction. We know we can reduce carbon dioxide. Can we reduce it to the single product that we want at a reasonable energy? And it's even more complicated than just the catalyst because everything matters. So you've got the catalyst, not just whether it's copper, but the shape of the copper, what are called the facets, how it's put together, how it's shaped what face of the copper is exposed. Different ions and elements in your water or your solution influence um, the activity and the selectivity. And then the particle size, the porosity, the roughness, all of these things matter for CO2 reduction. So it's a really complicated system with lots of moving parts. And that's why it takes thousands of researchers to study it and try to understand this. And this is just for copper. And there are lots of other materials we're looking at too. But what I wanna focus on is this part right here that says local CO2 concentration and pH gradients. Another way of saying that is local transport of our reactants or how we transport our reactants to our surface. So if we have all of these different pathways that we can explore, each of these pathways at the beginning has to have CO2 transported to it and have to have protons because those are our reactants. We get the protons from water, but those are our reactants. They have to transport to our catalyst. So if we wanna control the CO2 reaction pathway, we should control the delivery of CO2 and water. And if we can control the ratio of those two reactants at our surface, at our catalyst, we can help control the pathway that we travel across. The second step, which we'll talk about after that, is controlling the chemical environment surrounding the catalyst not just controlling the delivery of our reactants, but controlling everything else around the catalyst that changes what the catalyst sees and how it interacts with those reactants. So if we think about controlled delivery in our system, here we have our electrode. What if we put a polymer or a film on top of it? Something that's porous, that has pathways for reactants to travel through, but that can control the rate of those reactants traveling to the catalyst. So we have the CO2 going in and the protons going in, but they're going in at different rates depending on the type of polymer that we choose. So this is actually a really cool way of controlling reactant um, our product selectivity, of controlling the products we, we get to by controlling the relative rate or the relative concentration of these catalysts at the, or of these reactants at the catalyst surface with these porous overlayers. And there are lots of people working on this. There's a really nice paper that just came out a year ago um, out of a Lawrence Berkeley lab uh, that showed this really nicely, if you take bare copper without anything on top of it under their reaction conditions, you get all of these different products again. You get hydrogen, you get some formic acid, this light blue is methane, you get ethanol, you get uh, ethylene, and the size of each of these bars is proportional to what fraction of the total products are that. So a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of ethylene, a lot of ethanol, but a lot of these other products as well. Now, if you coat it with different polymers, they use two uh, commercially available polymers, Nafion and Sustainion. When you coat it with those different polymers, you get different product distributions. When you coat it with Nafion, you get a lot more ethanol and ethylene. And when you coat it with a uh, sustainion, you do as well, but maybe not as much. And then they said, well, 
Why don't we coat it with both polymers? What if we put multiple poly polymer layers on top of it? They did that as well, and they saw even better product distributions, especially here. Now, these are special type of, uh, where you have Nafion on the exterior and Sustanion on the interior, and then copper. Now, these are special type of polymers called ionomers. They're charged polymers. And what they're doing is they're controlling the relative concentration of CO2 and protons, or in this case, their case, hydroxide, but it's the same idea. They're controlling the local concentration of the reactants, CO2 and protons, near the electrode by using polymers that have charges built in and that either inhibit some of those products or facilitates, or inhibit some of those reactants or facilitate the transport of some of those reactants to the catalyst underneath. So this whole idea comes down to this simple picture of they have a porous film on top of their catalyst that's controlling transport. And by doing that, they can dramatically change the different products they make. So it's a really cool result with this general idea. But we wanna, in, in my lab, we were interested in looking at something a little bit different than that. Not just controlled transport. We, we do wanna control transport, but we wanna control everything about the catalyst, not just can we have the polymer do more than just control the transport of reactants, but also control everything else surrounding the catalyst, the so-called microenvironment? And to illustrate what I mean by that, I'm gonna step back and look at what nature does. So nature you know, has perfected a lot of things. And this is a, an example of an enzyme called carbon monoxide dehydrogenase. Um, this is sort of the biologist biochemistry depiction of it. There's a, what you should take away from this is there's a lot of gunk, and then you've got this little active site right there. And that active site is where m almost all of the chemistry that we care about as catalysis people occurs. And all of the rest, everything else surrounding, all of these ribbons uh, uh, and helices surrounding that active site are there to control the environment around that active site, to tune that catalyst site in the enzyme at just the right energy and to control transport of materials to that catalyst active site at just the right rate, reactants at just the right rate to get the product you want. This is what enzymes are already do. All the enzymes, the proteins that do catalytic reactions have something like this where they have an active site and everything else surrounding it is there to control the environment and control the transport. Um, so it controls transport. This is a slightly different enzyme, hydrogenase. doesn't matter, but it, you can control the transport of reactants through various mechanisms, through relays. Uh, this is called a proton uh, transfer relay, but you can control it, a proton relay. You can control reactant flow through all of these systems by putting different residues, different amino acids in the protein that control the transport. And then the active site itself, um, you've got your metals. In this case, you have a nickel and a couple of irons. One of the nickels and one of the irons actually binds carbon dioxide in this enzyme. And you've got other things surrounding it, like histidines and lysines here, that stabilize intermediates through something called hydrogen bonding. These interactions beyond the active site, not just the metal, but everything else directly surrounding the metal that interacts with and stabilizes the intermediate. It modulates that binding energy. So that's cool, and enzymes do this really well. Enzymes are really hard to work with, and, um, and it's really hard to make synthetic enzymes. So what we like to do is to take, try to mimic the same thing but with what I call polymer catal uh, catalyst composites or po polymer encapsulated electrocatalysts, where we have our catalysts spread out through a membrane uh, or a polymer where that polymer can do the same things as the enzyme. So we choose the catalyst and choose the polymer to mimic what the enzyme does, but in a little easier to synthesize and prepare and study way. And so a lot of my work in my lab is focused on making these polymer catalyst composites. And all of these things surrounding the catalyst active site 
we call the microenvironment, the environment directly surrounding the catalyst site. So, you know, we use a lot of test case called uh, cobalt thalocyanin. Uh, it's just a, catal uh, just a catalyst that we like to use. It's shown by this molecule here. It's called a molecular catalyst because it's a discrete molecule rather than extended metal nanoparticles or metal surface. But it looks like this. You've got a cobalt, you've got some nitrogen carbons around it in this configuration. Um, this is sort of what we draw if you were in an organic or inorganic chemistry class. This is how you would draw it. Um, but the point is that of all of the different thalocyanins that have been studied, cobalt thalocyanin is sort of the best SCO2. So it's a great model system for studying these different effects. And if we take our cobalt thalocyanin and we just put it on an electrode surface, just as a catalyst with nothing on it, it will reduce CO2 and it will reduce CO2 to carbon monoxide with about a rate of one carbon monoxide per catalyst per second, which isn't a bad rate, not a great rate, but not a bad rate. And about 60% of all of the electricity that we put in will go to carbon monoxide. Oops. The other 40% goes to hydrogen evolution, which is a competitive reaction, it turns out, at this electrode. It goes to reducing water. But if we get about 60% goes to carbon monoxide. But if we take that catalyst and we put it in this polymer film where we can control transport but also control the microenvironment, Um, control the microenvironment like this, we get a fourfold increase in the rate and an increase in our efficiency up to 100%. So by controlling, by putting this catalyst in the right type of polymer, we can suppress the competitive reactions to get selectivity for our product we want, and we can increase the rate at the same time. And that's a really powerful thing. All by just controlling, by putting this in the right type of polymer and controlling the so-called microenvironment. And what we're actually doing here is this polymer has a couple of different effects. It can actually bind to the catalyst site. That binding to the catalyst site modulates the energetics and modulates how strongly this co cobalt can bind to CO2. It can actually stabilize the these CO2 by what's called this bound intermediate by what are called hydrogen bonding interactions, which are just interactions with different parts of the polymer. And it also controls proton and CO2 delivery. And all three of these things combined are why it has this increased rate and increased selectivity. And a lot of our research, you know, I'm putting this in one slide, this is about six or seven graduate students worth of research <laughs> to make this one slide, but we've shown that it does all of these different things. And that's what gives it the higher activity and selectivity. And this is just like what an enzyme does, where you've got hydrogen bonding interactions and you've got controlled transport. So we've mimicked what an enzyme does using a completely synthetic system. We're not the only people who have done this. A lot of people are looking into this, but it's a really exciting area of research to explore. And this isn't just, you know, like I said, a lot of people are looking on this. I, I was talking about a discrete molecule, but you can do this on surfaces as well. This is some great work out of Caltech by the Agape and Peters groups, where they put a type of polymer film on the surface as well. And that polymer film did similar things, hydrogen bonding, controlled transports, et cetera. And they get really high selectivity for different products like ethylene. Um, the Andrio Andrioli group has done something similar where they put a different type of polymer film called a polyacrylamide on the surface onto a porous copper surface. This is a scanning electron mic mic micrograph of what it looks like and they get high selectivity as well 
uh, for ethylene. And a really cool recent paper out of uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign by the Kenneth Zimmerman and Gilworth groups showed that if you take a polymer and you take a catalyst salt that you can buy and you mix them together in the right way and you polymerize them in the right way, you actually get very high selectivity for ethylene in an actual electrolyzer device. So this was a really cool uh, paper that just came out last year out of University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. But it's all this idea of controlled microenvironments, controlling the transport and also controlling everything that surrounds the catalyst site. Okay. So everything I've talked about about CO2 reduction, it's great, it's exciting. Almost all of it uses one atmosphere of CO2, 100% CO2 in order to do these reductions. And yeah, we do have an increase in carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, but it's not close to 100%. It's 0.04%. <laughs> so that's a problem. <laughs> and if we take CO2 from exhaust gas, it's more concentrated, but it's eight to 10%. And there's a lot of oxygen there as well which is bad for catalysis. So we need to find ways to concentrate or capture this CO2 and use it for CO2 reduction. We can't just keep doing CO2 reduction with 100% CO2. I mean, I can, it's great for fundamental science, but it's not gonna be practical. So we have to have ways of capturing and using this captured CO2. The most common way, and there's a lot of stuff here, I'm just showing this to give an example, the most common way, which is to take CO2, react it with something like an amine, doesn't really matter what, but in a, a something that will absorb it, and then oops, use that sorbent to concentrate the CO2 to 100%, and then use that 100% CO2. But there's a lot of energy barriers associated with that. Um, sort of the last thing I'll just say is, I'm part of this new center called the Center for Closing the Carbon Cycle that has a different idea for carbon capture and conversion, where you capture the CO2 using the same sort of absorbing molecules like an amine, but instead of trying to release the CO2, you keep it absorbed to the molecule that captured it, and you reduce that. So we're not doing CO2 reduction anymore, we're doing the reduction of a reduced carbon intermediate, a reduced captured CO2 intermediate. And we're trying to reduce that to our products. So it's a different chemical now. It's not just carbon dioxide. It's a captured carbon dioxide. And so this is a center now um, that DOE just funded called the Center for Closing the Carbon Cycle. And actually, I'm, I'm only one small, small part of this. You see University of Michigan right there. But this is actually being led down the street at UC Irvine by Professor Jenny Yang. So it's a, it's a really exciting, I'm really excited to be part of this and really thinking about new ways to think about CO2 carbon capture and conversion. So with that, you know, I'll just summarize. We talked a little bit about the intermittency of green electricity and why we need energy storage. We talked a little bit about designing new catalysts for solar fuels. We talked a little bit about controlling the microenvironments to improve catalysts. And then, you know, I, I showed you, I think, one slide on sort of future directions and where this field, one of the places this field is going, thinking about carbon capture and conversion together. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you, my research group, past and present, um, collaborators, funding. Um, the work I did talk about here was from the National Science Foundation, a little bit from the Department of Energy, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Thanks a lot for your time and attention.